should know us. The uh, Italian Banking Insurance and Finance Federation is, uh, let's say, the common house of finance of Italy. It comprises all 13 uh, current financial uh, associations from the banking to the private equity to the pension fund sector. So we are a uh, substantial uh, umbrella organization of Italian financial uh, uh, sector. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Nuno Bartolo, who will take over today and present us the priorities of the uh, Portuguese presidency. Uh, all sh short ado, I will not uh, uh, be long. Just to tell you some technical issues today, the meeting will be held in English. It will be recorded, but just for internal purposes. Uh, and also, uh, at the end of the presentation of Ambassador Bartolo, uh, there will be uh, some opportunities to ask questions. Uh, you can always post some of the questions uh, in the chat, which you can find above uh, uh, next to the people's button. There is a chat button. You can post your questions there. And in case if we have time at the end of the meeting, we will be happy to, uh, to uh, give them to the ambassador for any answers. Paolo, I would say I give directly to you for the initial presentation of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Emanuela, and it's my privilege to welcome you all, a particularly warm welcome to Ambassador Pedro Nuno Bartolo, the Ambassador of Portugal to Italy, who will be our guest today. I think it's become customary for us uh, at the beginning of each semester of rotating presidency of the European Union um, to engage in this formal conversation with the permanent representative of the country that responsibility to exchange views uh, uh, in formal context uh, on, uh, on how we see uh, the challenges and the progress that we can make uh, ahead. Um, we definitely have a challenging period ahead. Uh, Ambassador, I must say, coming after Germany is a challenge in itself, uh, particularly a rather successful, very successful uh, German presidency. But uh, the next few months will be challenging indeed because we are still in the middle of the fight against the pandemic, you know, containing the contagion, uh, the, launching the vaccination campaigns, uh, dealing with now that it is this threat and possible implications. So we are in the middle of this health crisis. At the same time, we have to deal with economic recovery and try to adjust the economy and the transition to the post-COVID new normals uh, and implementing implementing the ambitious. EU plans uh, that I think uh, in an unprecedented way, I think Europe gave a very strong signal of uh, its ability to respond to such, such a crisis, uh, the next generation EU, but not only also invest in EU, sure, and all the other, the other program. And we are also in a new uh, global scenario, a scenario that is definitely much more promising than it looked a few months ago with the new administration in Washington, um, but full of challenges, uh, looking particularly um, in the neighborhood of, uh, of uh, the European Union towards the East, uh, the Mediterranean, Africa. Uh, and uh, let's not forget that uh, Italy is holding the presidency of the G20 this year and also um, is a shared responsibility for the organization of COP26 uh, in Glasgow. So I think that there is a lot uh, in terms of uh, challenges, uh, there is a lot to talk uh, to talk about, and uh, um, we have looked at the program of the Portuguese president. It's very ambitious indeed. Congratulations! I think it, there are a lot of elements, a lot of things that uh, meet uh, has, has triggered our our attention and, and, and interest, and I'm sure that will come up also in the in the discussion. And and we definitely want to bank on the great experience of uh, the, the ambassador. Um, ambassador has had a very prestigious uh, uh, diplomatic career in the foreign office of his uh, ministry. Uh, he was also an economic advisor to the prime minister, to the foreign minister, so was close to the policy um, decision making process. And he was posted also an important capital, I think, uh, um, Israel, uh, Moscow. Uh, he also spent time in Geneva, he spent time in Brussels, so he's very familiar with all the multilateral and, uh, and the European institutional processes. So I think he's really the ideal person to, to, uh, to engage 
uh, in a conversation with, and we look definitely look forward to to having a discussion with him. Uh, I repeat what Emanuela said in terms of questions. I mean, I don't, there will not be much time for questions, but definitely, if you want to ask questions, please use the chat because then I think we will be able to sum the questions up and present it uh, to the to the ambassador. But uh, without uh, further ado, I am now very happy and grateful to give the floor to Ambassador Bartolo for his remarks. Thank you very much, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can see me well and hear me well. Thank you, Professor Paolo Garoni. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for your kind welcome. And I'm aware of the important work carried out by this Federation at this particular juncture. And I know how influent you are and how respected your assessments and stands can be. And I've seen the list of today's participants and I feel humbled and I'm grateful to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, but also a difficult and uh, thankless, uh, thankless task, uh, un compito ingrato, I think you said, for several reasons. The uh, situation is even more embarrassing if you consider, as you have uh, kindly reminded, that my excellent German colleague spoke to you in July, and I'm sure that he will have been brilliant. And now, six months later, it's my turn. Uh, how would I say? Dopo il Golia tedesco, un semplice... Davide Portoghese. Anyway, turning to today's topic and uh, Portugal's role, let me just put a few things into context. Uh, one year ago, on January the 1st last year, at the beginning of the presidency held by Croatia, there were officially zero recorded cases of COVID in the whole world and evidently zero deaths to regret. Six months later, on July the 1st, start of the German EU presidency, the director general of the should I say, hapless World Health Organization reported the total number of 10 million uh, cases of COVID-19 and about 500,000 500, deaths. This was the sad balance of the previous six months. And yet uh, in Europe, uh, the atmosphere, as you might uh, recall, was slowly becoming more positive, more carefree. And the main topic of the agenda, I remember well, was essentially the post-COVID. It was mainly about post-COVID that our political masters were talking about as they thought Europe had managed to weather the worst of the storm. Well, today, the 2nd of February 2021, the world records 104 million cases of infection and 2.3 million COVID-19 deaths in the space of just uh, in the space of just 19 six months, in the space of six months, uh, an exponential increase and still a lot we don't know about the virus and uh, its long-term effects. Unfortunately, the poor performance of the European Union and also of my country, I must say, was not and is not brilliant in this area, quite the opposite. So of course we should uh, face the future, try and see the best way to address challenges, even if we don't know exactly what lies ahead. Uh, after all, I think it was a Spanish poet who said, uh, traveler, there is no path, the path is made by walking. Viandante non c'è camino, uh, sei tu che fai il sentiero camminando. So we have to keep walking, but it's crucial to keep in mind the current context, uh, to observe our starting point, to assess the recent past, to analyze mistakes, to seek perhaps accountability, and to avoid showing complacency and self satisfaction. Because I think our citizens, our young generations, our societies will not endure. Uh, an endless pandemic, uh, una pandemia infinita, uh, with their freedoms violated or restricted, their livelihoods often destroyed, their prospects of, for normal life uh, greatly threatened, together with the serious risks for uh, the mental health of all of us, I should say. And last but not least, the perception also that this crisis will inevitably have permanent winners and losers, both in national terms, in terms of the sectors of our economies and also in international and geopolitical terms. I think it was Albert Einstein who said uh, madness is always doing the same thing and expecting different results. Uh, it's a wise uh, advice perhaps also for the EU and another quote that surely uh, is uh, quite often used in the financial world comes to mind where you, know, you are in a hole, stop digging. So I believe that it's more important than ever to realize that citizens of our 27 states, rather than continue to hear soothing, sedative words and promises of great futurist plans or EU presidency priorities, 
I think that what they want is to be sure that this nightmare that has befallen us for almost a year now will have an end, that their lives and their future will not remain hostage to the situation, that what we are experiencing will not be a pretext for some kind of great reset, and that the pandemic will not only be controlled, but defeated, defeated and eliminated like a, like a fire that uh, must be put out and with which neither we want or can live with, even if we get vaccines. And by the way, we are not yet entirely sure about the effectiveness or the availability of uh, vac vaccines. So I look from my point of view at this presentation of priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the EU today uh, or last week at the Italian Senate or later this week when I will go to the Camera dei Deputati, not to mention the press and the civil society and the academic world at large. I look at these exercises with a feeling of humility and a lot of caution, believe me. I'm well aware that we cannot proclaim like this uh, character in uh, Voltaire's uh, work Can Candide, uh, Candido, Dr. Pangloss, that all is the best, uh, is for the best in the best possible worlds. I think that all is not for the best right now and we all need a better world. So having followed since that uh, fateful 21st of February last year, the, the suffering, but also the ability to react and the dignity, the courage, uh, the generosity of the people of Italy, especially in the most mostly affected regions, I'd like to show great optimism at the beginning of this EU Portuguese presidency, or at least to make uh, mine the words of Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, uh, optimism of the will. But God knows how difficult and risky it is to be very optimistic in current times, in the EU in particular in the last few weeks. So allow me to be very careful. And I will also careful keep in mind the useful warning of uh, another author, a French writer, Georges Bernanos, when he said that uh, the optimist is a happy imbecile and the pessimist is a sad fool. L'ottimista è un imbecile felice e il pessimista è un triste imbecile. So presenting uh, EU presidency priorities can seem, of course, a little surreal or embarrassing in light of current circumstances, but it's still an unavoidable task. I know more or less what I have to do. I know more or less what I want to say. I just don't know how to make it interesting, but I will do my best and let me try and identify some lines of action briefly. The motto chosen for this semester is time to deliver. Uh, it's time to show results. The credibility of the EU is at stake, as you, Professor, reminded. The union will have to prove its added value, first of all, in the fight against the pandemic, all 27 member states have said since the beginning that they wanted more coordination at EU level. So let's see if it works and if it can do a few things well. One crucial area will, of course, be access by citizens of all our member states in conditions of equality to safe and effective vaccines. And then there is our common response, of course, to the economic and social crisis, also in terms of preserving financial stability. As you all know, important decisions were taken by the European Council last year. It's also necessary to remember the role of the Commission and the European uh, Central Bank for countries in the Eurozone. The EU has decided to adopt a recovery plan together with a new multinational, multi-annual financial framework. And uh, the EU agreed to organize a vaccination process in a centralized way. It's now paramount to set in motion and implement the decisions taken. And above all, results must be produced quickly. I think it was Bill Clinton who used to say, it's the economy stupid. So I would say it's the implementation stupid. So hence our motto, time to deliver a fair, green and digital recovery. A nice slogan that summarizes the three main priorities of the Portuguese presidency. The first one is the economic and social recovery of Europe, having at, as uh, its two engines, the climate and digital challenges. The second priority will be to develop the European pillar of social rights to ensure that this double transition, climatic and digital, will leave no one behind. And the third main objective will involve strengthening the so-called strategic autonomy of the EU, but of a European Union, I must say, open to the world. This is our vision.
The first condition for recovery is, of course, the success of the vaccination process, coordinated first and foremost by the European Commission. And I beg you not to ask me too many questions or to comment events of the past few days in this area. Anyway, since our governments, in their wisdom, have not pursued methods, more assertive methods applied in places like China, China's Taiwan, or Vietnam, or New Zealand, or even Australia and a few other countries to eliminate the virus, we all hope, of course, that the vaccination process will eventually allow us uh, to safely resume a normal life. It is imperative that we overcome the virus and try to restore full freedom of movement and the full potential of the internal market that is also at stake right now. But it's also essential to show solidarity for the global eradication of the pandemic, both in the European neighborhood, in Africa or in Latin America. At the same time, all instruments that have been adopted for economic and social recovery must be set in motion, starting with the recovery plan. That's why it's important to conclude the ratification process of the so-called decision on own resources in all member states without prior ratification of this decision on our own resources. The commission cannot go to the markets, quote unquote, and borrow the money for this recovery plan. And it will also make, uh, be important to make sure that the European Parliament will adopt the, the regulation on um, the recovery that has been already politically agreed. Finally, last but not least, the 27 national recovery and resilience plans must be approved. And there is a calendar for it. Let's keep in mind that the recovery of each of our uh, countries is insep inseparable from collective rec recovery at the EU level. In this context, uh, Portugal will organize a high-level conference to be held in Lisbon in June to discuss the economic and financial situation of the Union, taking into account uh, national recovery and resilience plans. It will be important to begin the implementation, of course, of the new multinational I say multinational, multi-annual financial framework, starting with those programs that have seen their funding strengthen. I'm thinking about this Horizon Europe on uh, R&D or EU for Health or the Erasmus Plus programs. But uh, fighting the pandemic, of course, should not mean that the EU suddenly can overlook some essential challenges that we had and still have before us. And that's why the European recovery must be based on the engines of the so-called climate and digital transitions. We are in the middle, of course, of a full health emergency, but we continue to be in a climate emergency also. Uh, environmental problems have not disappeared suddenly, and we cannot allow ourselves the luxury of wasting time. The European Green Deal is urgently needed. The fight against climate change must be a cross-cutting objective of all union policies. So that's why we will strive to have the new uh, European climate law approved during this semester. And for that to happen, we need to reach a political agreement with the European Parliament, as this is the decisive decade which requires the greatest effort and the greatest ambition so that the EU lives up to its commitment, its promise to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. But this is also the decade of digital Europe, so that none of our countries falls behind in this ongoing competition on a global scale. And in this sense, we will pay particular attention to the digital services package recently proposed by the Commission as a fundamental uh, instrument for the protection of individual rights and democratic sovereignty that will also introduce more competition in the digital market stimulating entrepreneurship and creativity. In short, the presidency's idea is that the recovery cannot just try to respond to the needs of the present uh, with more or less effective economic stimuli, but that it is also paramount to have investments and reforms that will allow all EU countries to emerge from this crisis stronger, more resilient, more respectful of the environment, and with significant progress achieved from the point of view of digitalization. The so-called climate and digital transitions are seen by the presidency as urgent and essential challenges for our societies. But it is well known that they worry many of our small and medium enterprises, and it is well known that millions of workers in Europe uh, are fearful businesses also are afraid of losing competitiveness 
or failing to modernize. Workers fear for the future, the future of their workplace, of new forms of employment, of the virtualization of hard won rights. And that's why uh, in the wake of European Parliament communication on social Europe for just transitions, that's why our second priority will be to implement the so-called European pillar of social rights as a basis of trust in climate and digital transitions. We need to, on the one hand, strengthen skills. Uh, I think the English terminology speaks of new skills, upskilling, reskilling, so that our citizens can be actors and not just victims of these transitions. We also need to invest more in innovation to strengthen the competitiveness of our companies. And last but not least, we need to strengthen the social protection to ensure that no one is left behind. So the central event of our presidency in this field will be the social summit, which will take place in May in the city of Porto with social partners, civil society, the presidents of institutions, and of course, member states. This uh, social summit will have to bring strong political impetus to the action plan the commission will present in March, aiming at putting into practice the 20 general principles proclaimed in Gothenburg. Here too, it's time to produce tangible results and the development of social pillar is uh, essential, according to the presidency, to restore confidence to the citizens of the 27 countries that changes underway are not only a threat, but can also be seen as an opportunity. Fulfilling the social pillar will be, in our view, the best antidote to inequalities and fears. Our third priority is to consolidate the strategic autonomy of a European Union open to the world. As this pandemic has shown, uh, our countries cannot depend entirely on third parties for the supply of essential goods or on extensive value chains, which have a great risk of disruption. And we all remember uh, what happened in the first weeks of the pandemic in Europe when some country countries banned the exports of protective material, even to other member states more affected by the virus, such as Italy. We must therefore uh, strengthen the autonomy of our countries, and this is a challenging debate as it touches on industrial competition and trade policies at the same time. None of this should mean, in our view, a protectionist drift or the promotion of self-proclaimed European champions, uh, industrial European champions, because the EU has a competitive advantage, in our view, in the fact that its economy is based on a network of small and medium-sized enterprises and on a research and development and innovation system which must be enhanced and integrated into global value chains. We look forward to the updating of the industrial strategy that the Commission will present, and we hope it will help promoting this vision. Finally, the consolidation of this so-called strategic autonomy means a Europe capable of being a global player, upholding its values, including social and environmental standards. We will strive to strengthen the neighborhood partnership in the East and the South, together with a strategic partnership with Africa, as well as our relations with the UK, the United States, and Latin America. Of course, Great Britain deserves special attention as a new neighbor and an old ally who will continue to be a very important partner. We look forward to the consent of the European Parliament to the agreement on trade and cooperation reached on Christmas Eve, and we will continue to work towards the establishment of a comprehensive framework for our future relationship with the UK. At the start of a new administration of the United States, we hope to be able to collectively relaunch transatlantic uh, relations, especially in the areas of climate, the fight against the pandemic, uh, encouraging greater respect for multilateralism, and working in the areas of security, commerce, and also digital. The Portuguese presidency also intends to promote strategic uh, partnership and collaboration between the European Union and India, and that's why we will host an EU-India summit in the city of Porto in May. The consolidation of trade and investment will be discussed there, as well as cooperation in the fields of digital, pharmaceutical, science, and space. Migration. Migration is an issue on which there are different sensitivities within the EU, but on which Italy has always counted on concrete solidarity from Portugal. Uh, migration management requires common European action. The German presidency produced 
progress report as it has not been possible to achieve tangible results so far. It will be our difficult task to proceed and uh, to work on the so-called pact uh, on migration and asylum presented by the Commission. We will seek to identify appropriate balances in particular between the internal and external dimensions of this dossier without neglecting the issue of legal migration. I, I hope you are, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we cannot see you anymore. No, that's funny. Mm. Let me check what happened. Anyway, let me finish my uh, sure. intervention and I will try to check what is going on. So I was saying that it's time to deliver in terms of vaccination, it's time to show results on the economic recovery front, on the development of a social pillar, and also on the consolidation of the strategic autonomy of a European Union open to the world. But according to the Portuguese government, it's also time to act for the future of Europe. And to this end, the EU might be able to launch the so-called conference on the future of Europe, assuming that everybody wants to reach a compromise on this issue. A conference that may perhaps prove useful as a forum for debate on what the 27 member states want to build together in the future. But uh, for us, this conference should focus on citizens' aspirations and anxieties and not on institutional techno-bureaucratic issues. It should concentrate on common policies and responses that uh, the EU face in the world that is less and less Eurocentric. The presidency will therefore try to ensure that such an initiative, the Conference on the Future of Europe, can be launched in due time. But we are well aware that uh, uh, sharing the same values does not mean leaving aside our national identities, and these will be taken into due account. So the EU has the vision, the EU has the program and the financial instruments to move forward. Will we be able to deliver? It's a difficult question. If you ask me, uh, our common challenges will certainly not be solved in six months. We know the responsibilities, but also the limitations and constraints of a six monthly presidency mandate in the current context. But based on the joint work of member states gathered in the council together with the commission and the European parliament, but also other stakeholders, we'll make every effort to overcome this unprecedented crisis a crisis that is becoming existential for a very large number of people. Great humility and a strong sense of responsibility and also a reasonable amount of experience and competence are required at this time. And this goes for the presidency as well as for the European Commission, the ECB, bankers and insurers, of course, financial institutions and so on and so forth. Everybody realizes that the road is uphill I'm sure Lisbon will want to do its best. So please wish us luck. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will try to check what's going on with the camera. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. A very comprehensive uh, presentation indeed. And I really appreciate it. Uh, also your, your cultural references, your quotes. I think uh, I was really impressed. I think it really gives us the, the, the full uh, sense of how important is Portugal um, in the history of Europe and what uh, the culture of this small but fundamental country has given us throughout uh, the centuries from the golden age of King Manuel I uh, uh, up to now and uh, in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much. I really have enjoyed uh, mm -hmm. your presentation. Now we have started uh, receiving a few questions. Let me uh, um, try to uh, collect uh, um, some of them and and, uh, and uh, put them put them to you. I think a first question set of questions is uh, around uh, the conference on the future of Europe. You you did mention uh, the conference. Uh, obviously, it's an important initiative launched by the, the Lion uh, Commission that has not uh, seen the light I and mean, has been overtaken by other by other more pressing uh, and dramatic events. But uh, definitely we. We, we have looked at it as a great opportunity for reopening the, 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 all the big questions that were raised, if you remember, at the time of the European Constitution and uh, efforts towards the European Constitution. So I think uh, there are great expectations. But if I can have from you, we can have from you a sense 
of what uh, what are the prospects, uh, when the timeline, uh, what are the political hurdles, uh, the difficulties. I think if we can have your view views on this, it would be really appreciated. Uh, let me add a second a second question because I think we didn't talk much about um, the political situation. Uh, in, in, in Portugal, I mean, we are all focused, concerned about our own political problems, of course, but uh, I think uh, from what I understand, I mean, you, you have gone through elections, uh, a new government uh, in a very smooth way. And I think uh, I would be, you know, in terms of information, if you can give us some information of what, uh, well, what is the Portuguese chemistry? What is your trick? I mean, how did you manage to do this uh, so smoothly and orderly? If, uh, because obviously it would be uh, interesting for us to 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 draw some like to learn some lessons. Okay, enough with two, these two questions that to kick kick off the informal part of our our discussion. So please, Ambassador, feel free to to make all uh, your your uh, personal comments and uh, and statements. Thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for the glitch in the camera. Uh, thank you also for your nice comments on my cultural remarks. Uh, on your last question uh, about Portugal, I would add another quote. I think it was the mother of Napoleon who said, pourvu que ça dure, hopefully, let's hope it will last, what you mentioned about this chemistry and uh, political stability. Having said that, I'm more of an expert, assuming that diplomats are experts on anything, usually they are specialists on general things, uh, I'm more of an expert in international relations than in the port Portuguese political um, situation, so I will not expand too much on that. But uh, uh, as you said, uh, we had presidential elections. Last year, we had uh, uh, legislative elections. There is a, a more or less stable majority, and certainly during this presidency, we hope that any internal problems will not pollute also our uh, fundamental role and responsibilities as presidency. So, pourvu que ça dure, as uh, someone said. Uh, in terms of the conference on the future of Europe, pandemic came, but even without pandemic, we had so many events in Europe uh, since the last uh, treaty changes. Uh, last treaty changes, you might uh, remember, recall the quite traumatic experience uh, that yielded a, a treaty that uh, holds the, the name of my hometown. I don't know if it brought luck to the treaties, but anyway, uh, the fact is that we had Brexit in the meantime. We had our peoples who are more and more expecting not theoretical debates. I think it was in the former Roman Empire that you mentioned the, that uh, some people were discussing the sex of the angels while the barbarians were at our gates. In this case, the barbarian is the, not only the virus, but the economic and social consequences that can um, be the outcome of this situation. And none of us, of course, wants to live in Hobbesian world where men and countries become wolves to other men. So uh, we have priorities, I would say. I notice my uh, presidency has put this conference on the future of Europe in on its agenda. It does not depend on us. Here too, it, it takes 27 to tango, plus the European Commission, plus the European Parliament. I think that uh, they have been arguing for more than one year about who should chair this uh, exciting forum. We will see uh, if and when they agree on a name or several names to chair this conference. We will be more than willing to launch the proceedings. In terms of calendar, I'm sure that uh, our French uh, colleagues, uh, with all the modesty that characterizes France, will want this conference, if it takes place, to be concluded under a grandiose uh, French presidency. Why not? Uh, we wish them luck. But uh, uh, as I told you, for us, what counts is if this um, conference uh, deals with concrete aspirations and even concerns of our citizens and not about discussing uh, methods of decision within the union or granting more power to this or that institution. I think nobody is interested about that. We want to uh, feel results also in terms of uh, 
conference, it's always good to speak. It's always good to speak about aspirations and to hear what everybody has to say. But we do not expect uh, the short term new treaty revisions. I don't think this is this is the outcome that our citizens are expecting from us. They want to know if they can have a normal life and a prosperous life. And that's the essential thing. If the conference can even collaterally contribute to that, why not? But uh, I wouldn't say that we are all holding our breath about this conference on the future of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, um, we, we have also uh, now, I think uh, I'm grouping two sets of uh, questions. I think uh, a group of questions concern our uh, financial agenda. Uh, you know, I think uh, obviously there are a lot of things in the pipelines concerning banks, uh, insurance and, and capital markets, um, capital markets union, uh, the, 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 the regulatory framework. Well, I, I, I know that you are not an expert and on, on this and uh, definitely, and I welcome this actually, because I think we, 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 we need as uh, experts of financial questions to broaden up our perspective and I think to look at, uh, at, uh, at um, broader um, and more complex uh, global scenario. But I mean, if you have any comment on that, I mean, obviously we would, we would welcome, I mean, we obviously don't need any detail, but if you have any sense of, of how um, you think uh, there is, a, if there is, there is a political climate for, for dealing with the, if you want the policy or political aspects of, of questions concerning regulation uh, and uh, making progress on banking union, capital markets union, which are big political, not only technical, but political problems. A another set of questions that um, also uh, I think uh, I want to group concern external external policy. I think you, you mentioned that and I found a lot of very interesting and ambitious uh, remarks in the, in the text uh, uh, in the text of the uh, Portuguese presidency, uh, ranging from the relationship with Africa, a lot of interesting um, um, events actually planned uh, in, to push onwards the dialogue EU and Africa. But I mean, a specific question that I think I wanted to raise concerns Latin America because of the, the trade, the investment, and, and also historic links that you have with with that continent, and whether you can say anything on 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 that, it would be it would be interesting. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, very ample, difficult questions. On the first one, of course, we will try to play an active role in the European so-called European Semester which coordinates uh, member states' fiscal and economic policies. We, were, we will strive to deepen the European uh, Economic and Monetary Union, EMU, as a priority. This will, of course, include banking union initiatives, in particular the establishment of a European deposit guarantee scheme and the capital markets union. We will try to deepen the uh, EMU as it is essential to ensure greater integration and resilience of the financial sector and also to create financing and capitalization alternatives for companies, as well as to strengthen European competitiveness and the international role of the euro. I think we have uh, uh, read uh, lately interesting papers on this uh, idea of strengthen strengthening the international role of the euro, making also <laughs> Europe more resilient. I don't like this word, but it's a la mode, resilient also to extraterritorial sanctions. It's one of the uh, aspects that has been, is being discussed and is certainly of interest for your very wide and important constituency. And of course, we will follow up on the custom union's uh, action plan. We will address challenges of European taxation. And you mentioned the G20. And we know, of course, this is an area also where the Italian presidency of the G20 uh, will try and uh, achieve uh, progress in these ideas of uh, international uh, taxation of uh, digital companies, for, for instance. So this is an, an area amongst many others, like uh, health, where we will try as Portuguese presidency to have the best uh, find the best synergies with the Italian presidency of the G20. Also, Italy as the chair of the 
COP26 in terms of climate change, and also Italy as the convener together with the European Commission of a Global Health Summit in Italy. Um, that will be extremely important. Uh, so in terms of uh, our specific um, actions and the priorities in this uh, uh, economic area and financial affairs area, this is what I can tell you at uh, this stage. And uh, uh, of course, questions have not yet been asked about the issues of the recovery, but I noticed that uh, even in Italy, interesting debates have been launched, even by the European Parliament president, about not only the question of the usefulness or lack thereof of the so-called European stability mechanism, but also about what should be done in terms of the debt incurred because of the pandemic. So topics have been launched by quite relevant people. We do not exclude that these issues will have to be discussed further. Why not in the framework of this famous conference on the future? So trying to make a link between concrete uh, concerns on the uh, economic and financial affairs and the more theoretical uh, discussions at uh, European Union level, this is what I have to say. Yes, uh, our uh, agenda uh, is ambitious for in terms of a global, global Europe. Uh, it's not easy, as I said in my uh, modest remarks, we do not have the ambition to solve problems once and for all, or to achieve uh, magnificent development in the space of six months. It's an ongoing process, but of course, each presidency has the role to give its input, to share its experience, even its historic experience. We do not have the 2,500 years of history of uh, Rome and Italy, but uh, we have uh, 900 years of uh, a state with stable frontiers uh, and a stable state uh, for the better and the worse and with a global view. And uh, coming back to your question, this semester we will try to have a, an important summit with India. I think India is a very big country that should be engaged, not always easy to deal with India, for instance, on matters of trade and investment, but it's good to engage them, not in terms of rebalancing vis-a-vis -vis China. We also want to have excellent relations with China, but because on its merits, we think that India deserves more attention and uh, the European Union deserves more attention in India. That's why we will also organize a summit in, again in the city of Porto that will, uh, uh, with, together with the Prime Minister of India, try to develop our partnership. Uh, summit, you mentioned Africa. Of course, we would we have been at the origin of the first ever EU-Africa summit. Uh, summits nowadays are not convened by the presidency, by the, by the president of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, but we have several events related to Africa, also from the business perspective uh, to be organized in Portugal. We will strive for the convening of uh, EU-Africa summit because we have so many things to discuss from the pandemic to the issue of migration and development, but also because everybody realizes that Africa is clearly our neighbor, will be more and more our neighbor, and Africa is still uh, an area of great development and great opportunities for our companies, uh, first for the peoples of Africa, but it's a great opportunity for Europe to try and contribute to the booming of the African economies that we all want to witness in the next decades. So Africa will certainly be very high on our agenda. Latin America, perhaps you mentioned the trade issue. There is a trade, uh, ambitious trade agreement negotiated with uh, the Mercosur countries, but we have seen that uh, some European countries have uh, des états d'âme, <laughs> and now even countries that were traditionally hyper-liberal on trade front, like the Netherlands have difficulties on the grounds officially that there is uh, issues, and it's true, issues of environmental standards. We have to be careful and social standards also. We have to be careful that our environmental standards and our social standards, values that we like to uphold, that they were, are not totally jeopardized uh, by stealth through trade agreements. Having said that, 
we do think as a Portuguese presidency uh, that uh, an agreement with a bloc like Mercosur could be a very important milestone. I think it's worth looking at it. It's worth adopting it uh, with some guarantees. I understand that the European Commission and the Mercosur countries are working on some clarification of this agreement that uh, has already uh, been negotiated. I don't think the agreement uh, is going to be open or should be open, but I don't know. As far as we are concerned, we would be very happy to uh, witness the adoption of this agreement during our presidency, or at least substantial progress. But we know that even in countries like France nowadays, it's very difficult. Uh, perhaps there's also some hidden uh, agricultural concerns and they are very legitimate, but uh, officially it's essentially the environmental affairs that are of a concern to many European countries. I noticed that even a country like Italy, uh, with very good relations with the Mercosur countries, historically might have some problems uh, since Italy has not yet ratified, for instance, the, the CETA, the comprehensive uh, agreement with Canada that has been celebrated a number of years ago. And still after all these years, we are in a regime of a provisional application of some of the clauses of this CETA comprehensive agreement, economic and trade agreement with Canada. So we know that the atmosphere has changed also within the European Union member states as far as this uh, celebration of uh, major trade and partnership agreements are concerned, also because there were these uh, investment uh, and uh, investor state dispute uh, arrangements that were quite controversial. But as far as we are concerned, and like Italy for Portugal, international trade is very important. We will do our best to achieve relevant progress in the conclusion and expeditious ratification of all these agreements. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Indeed, uh, we need we need your uh, open uh, and global view as leader in this uh, semester to really push through these agreements. I understand the devil is in the detail when you touch questions, delicate questions of uh, trade and uh, and investment. But I think uh, you know we need to move on, and I think uh, um, the, the uh, Europe as as a beacon of of uh, um, a liberal new world order. I think this is something that that uh, it is in our courts, and I think we should move on, particularly, as you mentioned, in Latin America, Mercosur, but also in Africa. Uh, well, as you said, uh, the, this EU-Africa summit is a very poli important political event. It's also important to, to see that the negotiations um, for getting an, a, a post-Cotonou agreement is uh, uh, that, that, uh, that this is important and it, it concerns um, I think mostly sub-Saharan Africa uh, and uh, and I think this is also an important uh, mm -hmm. uh, step forward um, okay I think I have got a fine I think where we are time is pressing so I, I don't want to abuse your kindness ambassador but if you have a few more minutes um, just I think uh, on on the digital front on the front of digital um, union or digital programs. I think I, I've noted I've noted in your program a lot of events, a lot of things that uh, that uh, you you are doing. I think uh, uh, well. I think hosting, uh, I believe in Porto this ITU forum. Um, uh, then I think there is this uh, uh, digital day and. Uh, which is, I think, in March that you will, we will be celebrating uh, in Europe and then the Digital Assembly in June, um, uh, the launching of this new cable. I think, I mean, I'm not an expert uh, and I don't want, to, I, I don't know whether you, you have more information, but I think it, uh, by reading it in the text, it looked very impressive, this Ella Link table, cable that should link uh, Europe, Africa and uh, and. Uh, um, and, and, and America and, and going through the Azores and Madeira, I think this, this looks uh, impressive. So I think on the digital uh, front, uh, you, you are putting a lot of emphasis with a lot of events. I don't know whether you have anything to comment on that in particular, any event that you want to signal that is going to take place in, in the semester in, uh, in, in your country that we need to look at. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for raising that. A very important subject, such a vast subject, again, because it can and should be looked from so many different perspectives. You mentioned, of course, the infrastructure. Without infrastructure, there is no digital, digitalization. And uh, we're very happy that uh, there is this coincidence uh, between our presidency and uh, important uh, submarine cable uh, happening. Infrastructure is very important and the recovery plan, we hope, will contribute for all uh, European Union countries to improve their infrastructure. But we know also that uh, there are issues related to introducing more digital in our public administrations, in our education system, uh, in our uh, economies. So this is another area. There is an important issue of taxation also of the uh, big uh, digital companies. Again, we are talking about digital when we are talking about uh, the taxation of these uh, big uh, multinational companies. There are issues of competition, how to ensure uh, level playing field for all companies, uh, European and non-European within our uh, territory. There are issues of human rights also, of uh, freedom of access, uh, of how to fight abuses and illegal uh, patterns uh, in the digital world without uh, entering into a brave new world of uh, censorship and uh, uh, violations of uh, freedom and uh, human rights. Uh, when you see that even the president can be censored by Twitter and Facebook, we start being concerned uh, without entering into the merits of the said president. Uh, so digital is such a vast issue that uh, inevitably we wanted to put it uh, even in our motto because we want to deliver results in the fields of recovery, fairness, green, and digital. Digital will certainly uh, be uh, the occasion for many meetings, some of them at high level in Portugal. But above all, uh, the idea is to create more and more awareness that uh, there is a competition going on also in this field and that uh, Europe is not necessarily at the forefront. So this will be our uh, challenge if after this six months, everybody can say there is more awareness. Some uh, dossiers have evolved well. The recovery plan is uh, starting uh, with a great focus on uh, digital infrastructure. We will be very happy. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bartolo. Thank you really. Uh, I think uh, we really appreciated your presentation, your comments. I think we 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 have exhausted the time that we uh, did allocate for for our conversation. We have not exhausted the issues. There are a lot of things which uh, we 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 could have talked uh, about. I mean, uh, the so social summit. I think it's in the, the social agenda. I think you placed a lot of importance on the social agenda, and this is really something which is for us commendable and, and, and important to the Euro-Mediterranean, Russia and Eastern Europe. So there are a lot of issues, but time uh, time is up. I don't know if you want to make a, a final comment. Just uh, to say that it was very interesting for me. <laughs> and uh, day after tomorrow, I will be at the Camera dei Deputati. Uh, I've been already at the Senate. Uh, this was a very good experience for me also because it helps me understanding what are the real concerns not only from politicians, but from real stakeholders like the uh, people your federation uh, represents. And uh, believe me, uh, I know how sensitive more and more the, also the financial institutions, bankers, insurers are to this so-called ESG, environment, social governance issue. Perhaps one of these days we have to add a P, ESGP, P for pandemic. Perhaps you bankers and insurers will have to add the letter P and to address at, in any of your moves how you are contributing also to address the challenges of the pandemic or post-pandemic. I do not dare speaking about post-pandemic. But uh, so for me, it's also a learning process speaking to you and having to prepare an exercise like this from your point of view. So believe me, uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And you can certainly count on, on our uh, help, cooperation and support. And through us, uh, through the, the Italian Bank Insurance and Finance Federation, the whole of the Italian financial community. Also, we, we wish uh, through you to establish 
uh, we have already good links with the uh, financial community, the banking and uh, financial community in Portugal, but definitely uh, we, we hope that in this period we can, through also your good offices, we can increase the dialogue, improve the di strengthen the dialogue uh, with, with them. And uh, and then uh, what else to say? I regret at this time of our meeting, we, we used to have coffee together and uh, uh, cappuccino in Cornetto and continue the conversation. Well, uh, we miss the cappuccino and the Cornetto and uh, we miss above all the opportunity of the informal uh, taking coffee together and continuing the conversation. Instead of a rollover of, instead of a rollover of debt, let's roll over all these cappuccinos and let's have them all at a... Uh, at once in the near future, hopefully. I'm looking forward to a presential meeting also with you. Yes, uh, so so do so do I and do we uh, at, at our federation. So we look forward to, to having an in-person meeting as soon as possible. Uh, for now, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you to, uh, to, to also your collaborators for having enabled us to have this conversation. And thank you to all the people who were attending. Uh, we hope Yes, we have uh, briefly... interesting and, and okay. have a good day and, and uh, have a good day and we will reconvene for other events some other time. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you to thank you, you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.